The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yui Shu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Happy holidays, Datables. Welcome to another episode of the Datable Podcast. This is a huge holiday week for everyone. So everyone's gearing up for celebrations and lots of eating and merriment. Yeah, the best part of the holidays. I still can't believe it's December. I just feel like this year has flown by, flown by, but I'm excited for the holidays. Technically, Hanukkah is starting on Monday, so yesterday as this is going out, and I'm gearing up to go to Florida tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I'll be in Florida, then New York. So we're doing the double hitter of relatives. So we're going to my partner's mom's house first, then my brother's house and my parents are coming in. And then we're going to my uncle's house in New York City. So we're hitting it all. I call this the couple road show. You know, like you're going on a road show. Hey, everybody, <laughs> let's celebrate. Yeah, we were like, let's see how this goes. Well, next year, maybe it would be better to do like a Thanksgiving one, Christmas the other, but we'll see. They definitely have their pros and cons, that's for sure. But be grateful for the fact that you have people to spend the holidays yes, with. Yes, very much. You, it's, you have more than enough people to spend the holidays with. I get that this is probably kind of a sensitive slash emotional time for many people. I think it highlights mm -hmm. what you have and what you don't have. Yeah. And I certainly remember the holidays I've spent alone and how how alone that could feel. And I've actually felt that while I was dating someone too. That was not a great year. But your ex December Yes. <laughs> yes, with my ex. <laughs> But December is such a wonderful time to reflect. And I heard this great quote today. And the quote is, either let change happen to you or change happen with you. Mm. And I do want to reflect back on my time this year and think about all the change that has happened with me and all the change that I hope to happen in the new year. And I don't need to sit back and be like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening to me. I can say that I allowed this evolution to happen, like taking control of that change. I like evolution. I think that's a really good way to put it because it makes it not feel as drastic. Like, okay, you said that you feel like this year change happened with you. What's like the number one area you would say is like the biggest area that you can point to? Mm, I think I've really let go of this preconceived notion of what success means in every mm. facet, in career, in personal life, all of it. And I used to be so stuck on, well, if I accomplished this, that means it's a marker mm. for success. And for the longest time, I kept thinking like, in, even in my professional life, I need to be at this level. It's not about titles for me, but it's like, I need to be at this this level for my mm -hmm. peers to really respect me. And this year I realized, holy shit, so many people carve their own path and they're so much more respected yeah. that I am starting to feel like, great, I've, car I've carved my own path without intentionally doing so. So starting in the new year, I'm going to intentionally keep carving that path. And it's a, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful freeing feeling to have. I mean, I think the same goes in relationships for sure. Like we talk about all the time that you can create the love life that you want, kind of throw back to last week's episode. That was the epitome of that. And I think, you know, these milestones, I feel like this year it kind of clicked for me. I remember actually going to this talk. Uh, it was an author. His name is Arthur Brooks, author, Arthur, but author, <laughs> Arthur Brooks. And he had this book, Strength to Strength. And he basically talked about how like we're so milestone oriented and achievement focused. And it mm. really detracts. And he was talking about like how later in life, a lot of people face depression because there aren't those achievements to go towards. Sure. And, you know, how do you start to reframe what success looks like. And a lot of that's like, you know, that's per definitely romantically as well. I think a lot of us, I'm definitely guilty of this, is putting really hard milestones. Like even as 
much as this person will text me back within 24 hours or I'll go Mm -hmm. get to date number three. And then obviously once you're in a relationship, it's the moving in, the marriage, the kids, like all these milestones. And it's really hard to get out of that because we're so trained to do that. But I think I'm also really trying to like unravel that stuff. It's tough, especially during this time of the year, because I feel like... (laughs) Talk about arbitrary milestones. New Year's. <laughs> what an yeah, arbitrary milestone. There you go. Right? <laughs> it's legit happening in less than two weeks, but we feel like it's going to be this big thing that's going to happen. Right. You know, people are already saying, in the new year, I'm going to do this. Um, I'll deal with that in the new year. How is the new year any different than you going from September to October? It's this exact same thing. For some reason, we feel like there's going to be a universal shift in it all. So something I've started implementing at the end of this year is what are some things that I hope to do in the new year that I can start doing now? I'm just going to start it now. That's really good. <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things things it's one it's just like wishful thinking you know it's this yeah. okay things that might not be going my way or there's other areas i'd like to improve on oh yeah things will change in the new year it's this hope it's this glimmer of hope but i yes. also think some of it's procrastination too because i feel like i've done this before that i'm like oh yeah i'll do this in the new year and then january comes you're like uh i guess i'll do this in february and march right you know? yeah Mid-year (laughs) check-in. I think the one area, though, that is okay to procrastinate on right now, if you are super single, and I'm talking about like there's no one in the pipeline that you're actively talking to and dating, Mm -hmm. I feel like it's okay to take a break from dating apps right now. I remember like this time of year, just no one really being very available. Like even if you have nothing going on and – you're going to be in your city. I mean, many people are traveling this time of year. Of course, like by all means, if it's right for you, go for it. But if you're feeling burnt out by dating apps, personally taking the break at this time of year, just focusing on friends and family and even yourself, whatever it may be, helped me so much because it felt depressing. Like when people were doing all this other stuff and I wasn't or they weren't available and they're like, yeah, let's meet up in January. And it's like, okay, by then it's going to fall apart. I found for me, it was so much better to just take the break and then come in strong in January. And I know that's like kind of opposite of what we were just saying. But I think in this one instance, it actually makes a lot of sense. Take a break from dating, but don't take a break from personal growth. So we're not saying that, right? And I think this episode is so perfect for that. Because we're talking about relational intelligence. You all know what IQ is, EQ is. And now we have this (laughs) relational intelligence, which is also related to self-awareness, a relational self-awareness as well. And I've seen these frameworks of questions where you can ask yourself, what am I self-aware about? How self-aware am I? And what are my triggers? And how can Mm -hmm. I regulate these triggers? And we can take that into relational intelligence too. You're going to get a framework in this episode of questions to ask yourself, how well am I doing in relational intelligence? And where are some areas I can improve upon? And December is the time to do that. Let's take that time to reflect so that in the new year, you can, you are equipped with even more tools to, to date. Yeah, we're really excited to talk to Dr. Adam Bandelli on this episode. And he is an expert in relational intelligence. Like UA said, we always hear people say the number one thing I'm looking for is EQ, emotional intelligence. And we actually learned that relational intelligence is different. And he actually thinks it's more important. So Mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. People could hear the episode. But it was a really eye opening conversation, I think. And, you know, he talks about five different essential skills that you need to build, you know, relationships and relational intelligence. And I agree with you, like now is the time to, you know, curl up by the fire, put the podcast in journal, do all that. Like I would so much rather spend time doing that if I feel stuck than swiping endlessly on dating apps when we I know these people aren't going to actually be able to meet till mid-January anyways. Right, right. And you don't know what their intentions are, (laughs) you know? Is it like that last 
grab for a date, you right. know, before the before New Year's. I, who knows? Who knows what people's yeah. intentions or are? Or like home for the holidays. Yeah. Like, and I'm going to be out in a month. You, yeah, that's the worst. I've definitely been victim to that. I've also been the the person doing that. Yeah, home for the holidays. What my one of my favorites though, I remember I had a really depressing holiday season once and my parents ended up coming, so it wasn't like terrible, but it was I was here for Christmas alone and it was really dead. And I remember mm. I went to like a Jewish Christmas celebration to like be with other people and just getting there and it was just terrible and oh. leaving within, you know, like 10 minutes. I was also there by myself. I fe- at that time, I definitely felt like awkward going up to people and just mingling. This was many years ago. But I remember like I was leaving this party and I got a text message from this guy that I never even met up with, but I had been chatting with on dating apps. It was a group text. It was me plus like five other people just saying like, like, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. And I'm just like, what the fuck? This is so (laughs) weird. I'm like, why am I on this group text with all these randos? I'm like, are these other people he's like talking to on dating apps? Like, what is going on here? How awkward. What a weird feeling. Or maybe that works for you. I don't know. I'm not going to judge that. But to you, it was awkward. It was awkward. It did not serve you, but maybe for others, it can serve them. It's just that time. I think it's just a time of the year where our judgment is completely impaired in some ways. I still remember someone said, who you spend New Year's with is going to set the tone for the rest of the year. And I remember I was like casually seeing this guy who didn't give a fuck about like having a relationship with me. And we spent New Year's together. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is going to be my person this year. And of course, he disappeared the next day. You know, like, He's like peace such, out, January first. Such impaired judgment to me. I was like, oh my god, it's gonna be like a life changing moment for us. We're spending New Year's together. No, we're just spending any other day together. So yeah, just be aware of that. The talk about self awareness. I'm gonna be more aware of that. Cool. Well, you know, I'm so excited for this episode. We're going to dive right in. But before we do, a few announcements at Dateable Podcast. That's where you can find us on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok, YouTube, Dateable. Come there, see us chatting in the flesh. You can see our really cool backgrounds. I'm building us up right now. Chatting in the flesh. (laughs) Like we're chatting without clothes on. Chatting in the nude. If people need to come and subscribe and that's going to get them there, we'll do a bait and switch. No promises, but you should should just see what happens over there. I'm going to leave it intriguing, but also, again, we said this last week, but if you would love to give UA and I a gift, all Mm. we ask is for a five-star review at Apple Podcasts. That's it. That's it. It's free. That's it. Exactly. This will improve your dating karma. It's scientifically proven to help your dating life if you leave us a five-star review. (laughs) (laughs) and share this episode with a friend we said it also last week you know everyone needs that moment by the campfire doing their self-reflection whether you're coupled single don't give a fuck (laughs) depressed as fuck whatever it might be you need that time to reflect and think about relational intelligence i also feel like relational intelligence is really important even if you're not dating even if you're not t- spending time with your significant other, the fact that you might be around family members this time of year, oh, probably yeah. all good tactics there too. So, oh, yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, before we get into it, let's hear a message from our sponsor. This episode is made possible by the book Colorado Country. New York Times bestselling author Diana Palmer takes readers to Christmas time in Colorado, featuring solitary, silent cowboys who find their restless hearts tamed by women of uncommon grace and strength. A gift for readers who love heartwarming contemporary romance and gorgeous, rugged cowboys. Colorado Country is a collection of two novellas, The Snowman and Mistletoe Cowboy, collected in one volume for the first time. Both evoke the majesty of Colorado and the strength and passion of the men and women who live there. Meadow Dawson is struggling to manage the enormous ranch she just inherited. Too bad she's not on speaking terms with the one man who can help her out. Then you have widowed schoolteacher Katie is starting over with her young daughter, and she knows the perfect place, her grandmother's Colorado ranch. 
a horse wrangler named Parker shows up at her door. He knows all there is to know about horses, but with Katie, he's learning about the gift of family. Find out more about Colorado Country by New York Times bestselling author Diana Palmer at kensingtonbooks.com or wherever books are sold. Okay, let's hear it from Dr. Adam Bandelli, all about relational intelligence. Wow, what an article title. You can win her heart, why every man needs to learn relational intelligence. I had to read that a few times. Relational intelligence. (laughs) What is that about? We've talked about emotional intelligence. We've talked about positive intelligence. Now we have (laughs) relational intelligence. And it's important for us to understand what that means. We talk about relational skills all the time on this podcast. Yeah. So this is why this is such an important conversation. So thank you for joining us, Adam. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. So who is Dr. Adam C. Bendelli? He's in his early 40s. He lives in Staten Island, been there for two years, originally from New Jersey, single and actively going on dates. And more importantly, he has a PhD in organizational psychology and is the author of Relational Intelligence, The Five Essential Skills You Need to Build Life-Changing Relationships. And another book called What Every Leader Needs, The Ten Universal and Indisputable Competencies of Leadership Effectiveness. Of course, he's an expert in communication, relational intelligence, and leadership effectiveness. He primarily works with business leaders, but also works in all capacities that applies to all kinds of relationships, including romantic ones. And that's why we have you on our show. Welcome, Adam. We're so happy to have you. My pleasure, John. So we sit at the top of this episode. We got EQ, we've got positive intelligence. There's all kinds of intelligence out there. Relational intelligence, what is relational intelligence? So relational intelligence, we define it at our firm as the ability to successfully connect with people and build strong, long-lasting relationships. And so relational intelligence is comprised of five skills. I'll go through them in a moment, but these skills are skills that people can learn, they can practice and work on. So it doesn't matter if you're an extrovert or an introvert. It doesn't matter if you enjoy trying new experiences or you like to kind of have the status quo and do what you normally do. These are behaviors that people can practice and learn from. Before we go into the skills, because we are a 100 percent going to go there. Mm-hmm. We definitely want to learn the skills. What is the difference between relational intelligence and EQ or emotional intelligence? Is it the same or is there a difference? No, they're two totally different concepts. So EQ is really most likely often defined as the ability to understand your emotions, the emotions of others, and how to manage emotions effectively. And so what we found out, I started doing research on EQ about 25 years ago when Daniel Goleman first came out with his book in 1995. And it set me on this path over the the 10 years of my kind of educational and graduate work to really dissect EQ. And what we found in the research is that leaders, people, dating, personal relationships can use emotions to inspire or to draw a connection with people, but they can also use emotions to manipulate. You see Machiavellian or narcissistic type of people. They could instill fear in others. So when we came to that conclusion that there's a dark side to EQ, my colleagues and I said, well, there probably is a group of skills or a group of behaviors that people can practice at work or personally that help them to build long-term successful relationships, the things that make marriages last, the things that make leaders move up through organizations. And so that led me to do my doctoral work and ultimately my dissertation on relational intelligence. So EQ in and of itself, it plays a role in one of the five skills because you have to understand your emotions and read others' emotions when you're building relationships, but it's just one piece of the bigger puzzle of relational intelligence. We've had so many conversations about just self-awareness and personal development on this show. And I think there is kind of a movement in that space right now where for so many years we were focusing ourselves looking inward in yeah. silo and now with relational skills it's like how do we relate to others and how do we allow other people in our lives and create the space for other people what do you see is kind of the appetite for something like this right now why is this so necessary for our society right now so there's a number of reasons i think there are three major ones especially in 2022 why relational intelligence matters we've come out of the pandemic now we were in the pandemic for two years where people were socially isolated. So having that human face-to-face in the room, making eye contact, we lost that. The art of communication, I believe, was lost. And so people were hungry to get back out there, socialize, connect, go on dates, meet new people. We also look at kind of the social justice events that took place in 2020. A lot of organizations have talked about, you know, bringing in diverse candidates and kind of growing around inclusivity. What we believe is one of the key components of relational intelligence is authenticity. And so people who are comfortable in their own skin, 
organizations kind of know they're good, bad, and ugly and how they show up on a given day usually build better relationships because they're being authentic. And then we look at the last year with the great resignation on the business side, people are leaving companies today because they don't have those connections with their bosses, mm, with their managers. That is super fascinating because I feel like this whole self-development and like self-improvement category is like, how do I fix myself? And yeah, what I'm yeah. hearing is how do I just show my authentic self? I mean, we definitely feel like that's the key to finding a relationship, not necessarily exactly. changing yourself. Yeah, like we yeah. hear all the time from people. I know relational intelligence expands beyond EQ. But we hear EQ is one of the most important things I'm looking for in a partner, even more than IQ in some cases. Yeah. Why do you think like EQ and then relational intelligence larger is so important in partnerships? Yeah. So, I mean, I think to really understand and know yourself, you have to know how emotions impact you. And so EQ is critical in building relationships because there are going to be times when stress or pressure hits any relationship, a work, a personal relationship. And if you can't understand why you're feeling the way you're feeling, I have some close colleagues now, one of them is going through a divorce. And it really was a breakdown of communication where his wife and him just couldn't communicate and get on the same page when they had problems or fights. And then I have other people, I was just visiting my family down in Virginia this past week, my nieces and nephews, watching my brother and his wife like partner on how they navigate when the kids are misbehaving or when they have to do something important as a family. And so understanding your emotions and knowing how to manage them is important. Relational intelligence is even more critically important than EQ because it's about how do you build a long-term dynamic relationship? with your partner. And so early stages of dating, the things like building rapport, which is one of the skills is really critical. As you get into a relationship, developing trust becomes the most important factor. Mm -hmm. There has to be a unconditional trust that exists between you and your partner. And then one of the most powerful skills of relational intelligence is cultivating influence. And that's the ability to have a positive impact on someone else's life. And you would expect your life partner, your husband or wife, your spouse would want the best for you and want to bring out the best in you. And so with that piece, relational intelligence, when people practices. They're able to help support their spouses or their partners and help bring out the best of them. Oh, man, I'm starting to see this parallel. I know you work with mostly with business leaders, and I get it now because companies are so focused on acquisition of new talent yeah. that retention's becoming a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have the influence and the relationships built within a company, you retain your yeah. employees more. But in a relationship, same thing. Daters yeah. are so focused on acquiring a new relationship, yeah. starting a new relationship. How do I DTR? How how do I get this person to like me back? But the retention yeah. of that relationship yeah. is something that we are now turning our focus on. And that's a great thing. But so, yes, the pandemic really, you know, see this happen. But we are also seeing just from our end, our listeners are saying, I'm giving up on dating. I've tried and it's not working for me. I'm giving up on dating. So why <laughs> should I care about working on my relational intelligence when I'm not relating to anyone? So it's funny. I'll ask both of you. I've been single now for a year and most of the women that I've gone on dates with have said to me, I want to find a man who's not emotionally unavailable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I unpack that with women and we talk through it, it has bits and pieces of authenticity, it has bits and pieces of trust, it has bits and pieces of managing their emotions when they're angry or frustrated. It's going on dates when they meet narcissists and men that just like to talk about themselves. So I think there's a lot when you think about emotionally available and what that looks like. That kind of ties into a lot of what relational intelligence focuses on too, especially for men who like to show off what they have, they like to impress women, and they have have very little humility. I've seen it in the clients I work with. I see it mm. in friends, family. It's hard for a man to be vulnerable. And I think if a man is comfortable in his own skin, he's authentic. If he can be vulnerable, and again, you don't have to share dark secrets about yourself, but talking about lessons learned as you get to know a partner, you don't have to tell him about all your great successes. Maybe there's something more powerful from what happened positively or negatively in your life. I saw this quote on askmen.com about a couple weeks ago that most partners on Hinge when they're first going on dates, about 85 to 90% of them want to date someone who is open to therapy or has done therapy. Mm -hmm. at the yeah. life. And so again, that's yeah. fascinating. Like 10 years ago, there's still a stigma around mental health and therapy. It's a little better now than it was. But to see people in dating relationships value that and want that is important. You know, we did this episode. It was an article called The Rise of Lonely Single Men. It started to get viral. And we did talk about, you know, how it's hard for men to be vulnerable. And yeah. a lot of it's the way men have been socialized. But yeah. we yeah. also would say we argue it's hard for everyone to be vulnerable right now. Like women too. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of trust issues with dating after the strings of ghosting and yeah, love bobbing and roaching and all the stuff that comes from modern yeah. dating. It can be really hard. Yeah. So I think this is a good time to go into like, what are these skills? Like how yeah. can we go through these skills and talk about it 
through the lens of how they're important when you're finding, like in the dating scene, looking for a partner, but also maintaining a long-term partnership. Yeah, that's great. We'll go through each one. So the first skill is establishing rapport. And that's the ability to use energy to create an initial positive connection with another person. So in the dating world, it really focuses on making a good first impression. Mm -hmm. So when you sit down for a date, or even when you start messaging on a dating app, what is the perception or what are you putting out there for the partner to see about yourself from the pictures you choose to the things you say in your profile to the questions you start to text and get to know them? It's about the excitement and enthusiasm that you bring. If you're going to be boring and not really engaged in the conversation, you're not going to have a connection. And part of that is also finding common ground. What are the similarities between the two of you? Nonverbal behavior, body language when you go on that first date is really important. Being able to have that connection. And it's things like, you know, just genuinely showing an interest in what a woman is communicating. Or when you sit down for the first time, focusing more on her and asking questions rather than just as a man telling her about what you've accomplished. Listening more than you speak. When they're speaking, are you listening to understand or are you listening just to response back or share something about yourself? Can you use humor appropriately? to kind of engage and draw a woman or a man into a conversation. So establishing rapport is really that foundational piece that starts off any good relationship. And if you bring positive energy, you're going to have more likely of a chance to have a connection than if you don't bring any energy or you bring negative energy to the situation. Okay. So our listeners are frantically taking notes because that was a thousand (laughs) things that they should be working on. (laughs) Guys, hopefully you can share the dating article. We have it all outlined in there. So for sure, it'll be helpful to you. We'll definitely do that. But I think it's good to go into some real life experience examples so people Mm -hmm. can understand how we can put this into practice. Can you give us an example of a recent date that you had where you were both successful at establishing rapport? Yeah, a recent one that I went on. We started talking on the app for like about a week or so, exchanged numbers and started texting. And for me, I like to know about a person beyond the profile or physical attractiveness. So again, as a psychologist too, I guess I come at it from a different angle. Yeah. But I'm asking questions about where they grew up and what are some lessons they learned, you know, in college. Who are the friends that they associate themselves? with? What are the similarities with those friends? So you draw someone out in a conversation, even if it's over text, it's a good thing. I'll usually want to do, I'll have my little uh, hurdles before I go on a date. I want to do a FaceTime or something just to make sure the person is who they say they are. And so then really even on a Zoom, on a FaceTime, it's really getting to see if that chemistry is there. Do we share similar hobbies or interests? And if we don't, is there an appetite for learning? I'm a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. I value people in my life who are like that. And so I'm always up to trying something new. And if someone has something that they're passionate about, then I want to try it out and see how if I like it as well. When you go on the first date, everything from dress, how you appear, how you show up on the date, where you go, making it the right place. So we picked a place. I live in Staten Island. She was in Queens. So we met in New York City and we met for a drink that could turn into dinner if we wanted to, but we wanted to see first, you know, face to face if we'd have the chemistry. And it was just immediately a connection in terms of the eye contact when someone's talking. Mm -hmm. Both of us were leaning into the conversation, laughing, joking. Now, again, we had been texting for a week and we were kind of rapid fire texting throughout the days. So it wasn't this awkwardness, not knowing what to talk about. We had already established that connection on the app and then texting. So it was more just a continuation of that. And I think that's a really good thing for anyone who's kind of early stages of dating. Mm -hmm. The more touch points you can have and get to know each other without being overboard. I mean, you have to balance it. You know, you can't send (laughs) messages and get not get one back. But you'll usually if there's a good chemistry there and both people like each other, there'll be some back and forth. And it's a good way to kind of build a foundation even before that first date. Now, that's really great. And I know like you're also speaking as, you know, someone that's dating women. But this, in my opinion, applies to everyone. Like this is 2022. Like it should not be on one person or another. Like everyone should be establishing rapport and doing these skills. We do hear from some daters and, you know, we call this the dater view when you go in and it's kind of like a job interview. (laughs) And it Mm -hmm. could be that or it could just be, you know, lack of you think you need to bring this date self. Maybe you are able to like relax with your friends, but for whatever reason, it's harder to do it on dates. Yeah. What advice would you have for people that, you know, are struggling to establish rapport? Like it doesn't come natural to them. So I would say two big things. You have to be intentional and authentic in how you go about doing dating. You don't want to show up at a date and be robotic in the questions that you ask or have a list. We talk about in the work we do consulting wise, have like three swim lanes or three things you want to talk about. Maybe you want to talk about, and you know, shared hobbies or interests. Maybe you want to talk about travel and kind of places that the person has been to. Maybe you want to talk about, you know, their career or things like that. 
come to the date with questions, not trying to show yourself off. Again, applies to men and women, probably more so for men. But I think in my dating life, I've seen women be more interested in going on a second or third date if I'm showing up as curious and inquisitive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If I'm showing empathy and putting myself in their shoes as they're sharing their stories. If I'm leaning in, letting them finish, but then asking a probing question that you would have to ask if you were paying attention and not just waiting to respond. Those type of things I think any person can do regardless if they're more introverted or shy or they haven't done this often before. They're in a relationship for a long time and now find themselves on the dating scene. Authenticity and intentionality would be the two big things. I love what you said because I think everyone likes a date where they feel seen and heard and curiosity is a way to do that. What I like what you said about the three swim lanes is it gives you some idea of what you can talk about without over planning, but also some people get anxiety not knowing what they're going to talk about at all. (laughs) Exactly. But I think the most important thing is that you let the conversation organically happen and you ask those curious follow-ups. Absolutely. The other thing that I would say for most people, you have to be comfortable with silence. Yeah. For me, even in my career, it took me about a decade to really, you know, talk to a client that I'm coaching or working with and have silence for 10 seconds, 15 seconds. A lot of times people are processing what they're talking about or what they're thinking. But as soon as you, especially in dating, when you hear that awkward silence or you don't know what to say, (laughs) someone will just jump in to break that silence. And silence is okay. It's a time for both people to reflect. But that's probably one of the hardest hurdles to get over is, you know, what do we talk about? We talked about three things and I don't know, the date just started. We only had one drink. (laughs) Okay. I like this idea of talking about this in terms of rapport versus chemistry. Mm -hmm. Because we do hear from daters like there was no chemistry. We didn't have chemistry. But I think by saying you have the control to establish rapport means let's not focus on the chemistry. Let's build that rapport first. Can we go to the flip side of something like this where what happens if no rapport is built? (laughs) What happens in this relationship? I mean, if rapport is not built, then the foundation is not set for wanting to be with that person. Again, I went on a date two years ago with a woman and there was just a defensiveness as soon as we got on the date. Mm. And I tried to joke and have some light humor. And it was very much, you know, easily offended. And it it just set a bad tone for the entire date where I started saying to myself, okay, I have to watch what I'm saying because I don't want to offend this person. And she was more guarded. I think she had had a relationship that ended poorly. And so I could understand where she was coming from. But just the energy that she brought on that first date told me that trust was the big issue for her, that there was also, you know, I was already behind the eight ball before we even Mm. sat down. And so, you know, I think if you go through a bad breakup or if something happens, like you need time to process that before you get out there because the impressions you make on people, you know, she could have met me, four or five other guys who would have been good matches, but the way that she was showing up based on what happened in her history didn't let those things kind of go further. While we're on this topic, like how would you define the difference of chemistry and rapport? So rapport is something that you do. It's the act of bringing that energy and that excitement to a first date or the early connections. The chemistry is a result of building rapport. If you build it successfully, if you're intentional and authentic and you can you're comfortable in your own skin, chemistry will be there. You know, you may not have a great first kiss or things like even having sex. You know, the first time you have sex, you got to figure out each other's bodies. There's a right. process for that too. But if you're building rapport and you have to put work in to do that, like I said, the swim lanes or things that you're putting more intentionality in, they will be more likely than not that you'll set the conditions where someone will be more interested in you and you'll have the chemistry start to take place. But caveat is you can build rapport with someone, but no chemistry, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because then, then the bedroom stuff and kissing and all the <laughs> yeah. stuff, those things right. matter. <laughs> those You're things just matter. colleagues, which is That's fine. Right. You That's still right. enjoy each other's company. That's right. So <laughs> what we're gathering with rapport, it's basically like having the energy, the intangibles that come from a date that feel like you're listening, they're listening, you're sharing. Like it's not like a one-sided convo. And, you know, that balance is there and the feeling is positive net net. It's organic. Yes. Yes. Okay. So then hopefully this happens. You get into a relationship. Like how does establishing rapport or continue in the maintenance stage of a relationship or like yeah. maybe once you've been in one for a bit. Yeah, so that goes into the second skill, understanding others. Okay. And that's really about having the ability to be intentional about putting in the time and energy to get to know someone on a deep level. So this is where things like EQ become really important because Mm -hmm. you're going to be hearing things and learning things about your partner where they're going to be in different emotional states. Maybe they had a stressful day at work or maybe they had an issue with family members. So being able to understand emotions, read emotions, there's going to be situations where you guys may butt heads or have differences of opinion. So managing your frustration or managing your anger becomes critical. This stage, understanding others when you're dating, it's about actively listening, especially when conflict rises. 
arises. Are you mm-hmm. listening to your partner and really trying to hear where they're coming from? And are they trying to do the same with you? Talked about curiosity and inquisitiveness again. Those are important things as you get to know someone, wanting to know their story. You know, what are the things that shaped who they are? Our family histories and origins and where we come from, whether it's race, ethnicity, all those things factor in. And as you start to get to know someone and learn about their families and learn about what they're passionate about, being really curious to learn all aspects of it really matters. And then I think the biggest thing as you kind of move out of the early stage, I call it the honeymoon stages of dating into the reality phase is, Mm -hmm. are you able to show empathy? You know, are you able to show compassion when your partner's having a good day, a bad day? But usually we joke and I put in the article, you know, the reality phase is where two people say, oh shit, what did I get myself into? (laughs) Because you start to see some of the issues or blind spots that the other person has. But if you are using your EQ and if you're being curious and if you're being a good active listener, that will show up and make the relationship go further. Okay, let's say you build the rapport and now you're in this understanding each other stage, really getting to know each other. We hear this from some of our listeners. I lost interest. Rapport was great. (laughs) We built that chemistry. I no longer want to learn more about this person. How would you diagnose that situation? I mean, there could be a number of different factors. It could could be the sex was bad. It could have been that they lost interest in same activities. I think if you're really understanding your partner and getting to know them, you should know what the disconnects are on. Mm -hmm. I know from my own life, I was dating someone earlier this year and we didn't have the same values around spirituality and faith. And Mm -hmm. that was an important thing for both of us, but we just had a different opinion on it. She was a great person, loved the time we spent together, but that was something that was foundational where it kind of just said, right, this is not going to go any further. So I think most people, when they say, I just don't feel it anymore, the chemistry is not there any longer, there's usually a why behind it. And so it's kind of getting at the why, because you're going to step into a situation with a new partner potentially down the road. And the more you can understand your whys or what your deal breakers or what your must haves are, it makes it easier for you during the establishing rapport stage to kind of narrow the field or even on your dating profile. You know, narrowing who are the type of men or women that you want to be dating. So the example you gave with understanding others right here, right, was like, okay, we clearly didn't understand where each other were coming from, like, or we had differences. Yeah. How do you start to decipher between things that you should just understand versus those deal breakers or things that are just not going to work for you? There's something we call the mirror test, knowing thyself. And so I would encourage all your listeners, like, get clear on what your top values are. Get clear on kind of how you show up on your best days, what your blind spots might be when you're stressed. Ask a family member or someone that knows you really well. But if you have that understanding of what you're looking for and be very clear on it, you know, write it in a journal or put it in your phone in the notes. Like in my phone in the notes tab, I have like the top qualities I'm looking for in a partner. And so I know before I go on a date, you know, these are the eight or nine things that I want. And that will help you to narrow down who you're dating and what that looks like. Yeah, that's really hard to get clarity on, right? And then we also hear people saying like, I got bored. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I find this person boring. Do you believe that some people are just boring? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I I mean, uh, (laughs) I mean, mean, for, for me, like when I'm dating women, like I'm looking for someone who's willing to try new things. If you're just going to go on two or three dates and then want to watch Netflix, like that's cool, but I'm not a big TV guy. And mm. so if someone's not going to be active, it's going to, you know, I'll get bored very quickly. But boring for you. Yeah. But I had, I dated someone a year ago who liked to skydive and bungee jump and I did not <laughs> want to do any of that. And so I ended up being boring for her. She right. was having it's a cycle me. of boring. Yeah. <laughs> it's all relative. It's all relative. Exactly. Exactly. But I guess I'm still like the understanding others part, because as someone that's been in a relationship now for a year and a half, there's definitely times that like, yeah, this person met all my, you know, initial list of things, Mm -hmm. right? But we're human beyond a list. And, you know, there's got to be, it's still like, okay, even if we think differently or we do differently, it's still worth it ultimately to keep this relationship going. Like, how do you start to really just value the person or say like, overall, this person meets my needs. Like, how do I understand where they're coming from more? That gets into the third skill. Okay. The third skill is embracing individual differences. Mm -hmm. And this skill is the ability to be authentic in acknowledging and accepting that everyone comes from different backgrounds and experiences. And so in dating, to your point, Julie, it's talking about, okay, I now know who my partner is. We've shared some information. We've learned about each other. It's, can you be yourself around your partner? The dating honeymoon phase has ended now. You're going to have your bad days. He's going to have his bad days. Has the relationship developed enough of a foundation of trust where you can be at your baddest around him and he'll be cool with that. And he'll be supportive of that versus starting a fight with you. Vice versa, same thing. This is where people who are either 
either self-serving or manipulative, they get found out very quickly because you get into that phase of dating now. This is kind of the adjustment phase where you both are starting to think about, can we meld a life together? Mm -hmm. And can we start to have shared values and share things that we like to do together? You'll probably start to meet other person's family members and kind of the larger family unit that they come from. And so I think the authenticity piece is huge. And if you've established rapport and you've kind of built that initial connection, and then you've taken the time to learn about each other and understand how each other is wired, then it comes to like, okay, can I be myself? And can we do things together as we start to build our future? I'm definitely Mm. seeing how these all build off of each other for sure. It's like, I definitely was in this understanding others phase for a bit. It was a little challenging because you're like, okay, the honeymoon is over a little. The rose colored glasses come off and you're like, is this someone I could do life with? And then I feel like we've moved to this embracing individual differences. And I feel like we're moving now to kind of the next phase that we'll get into. But I do see how these are all like playing off of one another yeah. because yeah. you kind of need to do the understanding before you could do the embracing. And you got to establish rapport. <laughs> yeah. That then yeah. It's, it's connection. Right. yeah. I think they do fall in that order. Yeah. But it's not a linear order. You don't do this, build rapport first and then understand each other. It's not a check the box. No, it's not a yeah. check the box. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Your, your partner. You should always be understanding if both of you are continuing to grow and want to be better mm-hmm. tomorrow than you are today, that's going to be an ever evolving, you know, journey of curiosity and a journey of growth. Yeah. It's like a linear, but also a cycle at the same time. That's right. It's like you need one without the other, but it also never stops. And then you have to look at the seasons of life that you go in with a partner. Right. You know, when you're first meeting to when you get married to when you have kids, you're going to understand other things about your partner. I just saw with my brother and his wife, like there's things that they are learning about each other now when they have to kind of tag team to deal with their three-year-old that's breaking plates in the kitchen. And so there's different things that you see as you go through life with your partner. Okay. I'm putting myself in the shoes of someone who may be dating for a long time and they're just like, you know what? This sounds like a lot of fucking work. Isn't it easier <laughs> if I just find someone who's exactly like me? It's easier for me to understand them, easier for me to embrace our differences because we have none. none yeah. And then we've already built that rapport because we're exactly like each other. What would you say to someone like that? They might be the one that gets bored really quickly with their partner. <laughs> and it's going to be really hard to find that person too. That's the other thing. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. You'll be on dating apps. Yeah. I think it depends on the person too. Like, are you comfortable with the status quo? Some people people are comfortable with the same job and they don't want to challenge themselves. They don't want to grow. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. If you have a comfortable way that you've built your life and you're a person of routine or habit, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I would argue that even if you're like on paper, the most similar people ever, there's still going to be differences because you're putting two humans together. So you're always going to have to go through this cycle. If you don't, like you're basically just saying that I'm not willing to put in the work for a relationship. Yeah. You know, I'm asking because we hear so many people saying like, I need the similarity to be there. I need to find someone who's similar. I want to find our commonalities. I wonder if they're kind of focusing on maybe kind of trivial things versus, I mean, it doesn't really matter what you have in common. It's about that growth and curiosity and cultivating these skills with each other. And you would hope over time that a pairing would have similar interests that they start to do together. Maybe they take Mm -hmm. up cooking together. Maybe they pick up golf or tennis. Maybe they start to do travel. I mean, there should be things you and your partner start to experience that both of you individually haven't done before. That strengthens the bond as well. You know, my partner and I were talking about this. We do come from fairly similar upbringings, but we do have a lot of differences, just the way we process things because we're two different people, right? But we were talking about like another friend of ours that's dating someone from a wildly different culture and like they have very different upbringings. And we were like, is it that they'll just have like more growth in this understanding phase? Or is it that maybe like they are culturally very different, but like the way they process info is similar? I think every case you got to take as its own. Some of the people in my family are Muslim. Some of the people in my family are Christian. And just from a faith standpoint, very different kind of ways that people live their lives. So it's really kind of as you get to know your partner, like what are they comfortable exploring? What are, you know, deal breakers for them? Every relationship is going to be different. And you may have cultural things. You may have race, ethnicity things that come in. There are a number of different Mm -hmm. factors that can be like how people are different and then trying to find the commonality. But that's part of the exciting journey. Learning about someone who is from another culture or learning about someone who grew up in a different part of the country. Like all those things could be learning experiences or they can be reasons for a lot of conflict if they're not addressed and if communication is not there. I can see that. I do think there's a different approach that we can all take to dating and relationships, which is focusing more on the differences. Because I realized with my current partner, I was like, this is like the most I've ever felt in common with someone before. Because we come from similar cultural backgrounds, similar upbringings. And it made me realize I became really complacent in this relationship and getting to know him because I thought I just knew everything. We are so similar. Mm. And I realized we actually, like you were saying, 
Julie, like we do have a ton of differences I haven't explored yet. So instead of approaching, oh my gosh, we have all this in common, we speak this common language, it's more like what is more there for me to explore and learn about him? That's a great segue into the fourth skill, which is the most important skill in relational intelligence, that's developing trust. Mm -hmm. And the way we define that is the ability to be vulnerable and risk being exposed to the actions and behaviors of others. So if you're able to be yourself, there's going to be things in your story. We all hit storms in life, whether they're personal, professional, we have to go through struggles, challenges, and adversity. We often don't share that with our partners unless we're moving in the direction of marriage or a long-term relationship. And even then, a lot of people don't do that. And I think the relationships that really thrive, my colleagues who have been married for 25, 30 years, family members, friends, they say it's being willing to admit when you're wrong. It's having a humility about yourself to ask for feedback and try to get better. It's, you know, wanting to get better for your partner. That's a really important piece too. So I think trust becomes really critical because when you first start dating someone, you have conditional trust. You honor this commitment. We're going to go on a date. You said you're going to do something. You're going to be consistent. When you get to unconditional trust, almost like blind trust, that's where the degrees of vulnerability really come in so that you're trusting that person most of the time or all the time. Yeah. I mean, I think this is the essential of any long lasting relationship. Absolutely. And, you know, I see how it goes from embracing individual differences. I know this isn't a linear order, but they do build on one another. And like my partner and I have definitely been in this embracing individual differences. And I feel like we're now getting out of this into the next stage because I think when he would say, oh, we're so different, I'd take it as like, you know, that's not a good thing. But we're learning is to say this is actually helping both of us and the overall ability to thrive in this relationship. Like I'm definitely faster paced in some ways and maybe a little more impatient in other ways. And he's slower, but more patient. And like, he's helped me slow down to speed up. And I've done the same for him, like given him more ammunition. So I feel like the more we can start to view differences as a positive, that's when you see that this person is here and like the trust is built too. And I'll tell you a tip you could do next time he says we're so different to look at him and say, how are we different? In a genuine, curious Mm. way, you know, how do you think we're different? And that can be a whole conversation around ability and it can go many different places. And a lot of times people hear something, they'll get defensive. Being curious. Okay. I appreciate you sharing that. Why? Oh, we've had those conversations (laughs) and I've also got a defensive. So (laughs) we have to be saying in our firm, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So how how you ask that question. But I think honestly, even when those have been hard combos, it's getting us to the next phase. Sometimes you don't want to hear it, but like what you were just saying is you want to be better for your partner. That's right. And that's the trust. And you're just like never having those those conversations, how do you even know? I'll tell you one other thing that is really important when we talk about developing trust is this concept called intentional generosity. Mm-hmm. So in a dating relationship, are you doing things for your partner, just heartfelt things, you don't need to buy them a Mercedes or something crazy, <laughs> but are you intentionally giving to the relationship without the expectation that you're getting something in return? Mm-hmm. And really great relationships, both partners give to the relationship without the expectation of getting something, and that makes the relationship thrive over time. Mm-hmm. So trust is so hard because, I mean, I'm thinking about it. It's like, even though your partner is doing all the right things, this generosity is here. A lot of us have past traumas or past relationships yep. that the trust was broken. How do you not let that get in the way that you really focus on the relationship at hand and have trust and faith yeah. in it, essentially? So I would say in my life, in the dating that I've done over the last couple of years, you know, I had one relationship that was four years. We got engaged. And the things that really built up the relationship until things got kind of ugly was that we were open about our past and we talked about things, that vulnerability was there, that being herself and being authentic was there. So I think it's important for couples to talk about past relationships that were good or bad when they get to that stage. You don't want to do it too early and scare someone away. But I think, you know, if someone hurts you or broke trust with you in a really bad way, you should be able to share that with your partner. There should be an ability to talk about that. If that person really loves you and wants to build something with you, they want to know those stories to make sure that they don't ever intentionally or unintentionally have similar things happen in your relationship relationship. Right. The trust thing, because it comes from previous baggage, like you're bringing it on the plane with you in this relationship, Mm -hmm. you have to be able to open the baggage and be like, this is from the past, throwing that off the plane and (laughs) here's some new baggage we're putting on. But I want to relate it back to some of our listeners who are early dating, early stages. They may not be in a relationship yet, but I think these are great skills to work on, but also a great barometer of whether someone's right for you. Yeah, Like if you go down this list of 
myself, is this person, have they tried to establish rapport with me? Are they trying to understand me? Are yeah. they embracing our differences? And the trust piece is the one I really want to focus on for early dating. The trust is, we set a date for Thursday. <laughs> Do I trust this person to confirm that we have this date? Yeah. And if they break that trust, how do I move forward? How do I communicate that? The trust part is something we often let go in early dating. Like we're still like, oh, you know, we're trying to understand each other. Maybe it's just a communication style. If you don't communicate what you're looking for and your needs or they're not showing up for you, how can this trust ever be developed? Yeah. Right. This is a good list for even early daters to go off of. Yeah. There's a part in the book we talk about the five C's and three of them are commitment, consistency and character. So in the mm. dating world, do I know that you will honor your commitments to me to go on a date? Do I know you're going to show mm. up consistently like you did last time we went on a date and this time we went on a date and next time we go, can I count on you to be someone of integrity? You know, are you not yeah. going to lie or cheat or go behind my back? So those are quick and easy things that a person can do if you want to see how much they're investing trust in. If someone makes plans and breaks them from you, you know, two or three times, that should be your, you know, red light that this person may not be interested or they may not be committed. And so those are kind of the simple things you can pick up along the way in the early stages. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that back, you because I do see how establishing rapport, understanding others, embracing individual differences and trust, they just show up differently depending on your stage of relationship. Like they're all there. Like even understanding others, like there's going to be times that you realize there's a difference. Like even let's say it's something as superficial as you have a different interest. Do you yeah. ask mm -hmm. questions to understand it? Or is someone just like, oh, like I don't want to date someone that doesn't like snowboarding. You know, like that's right. huge even like early days. So I do think it maybe gets deeper as you keep going or maybe more comes up that's a little less superficial, but it shows up everywhere. And I will tell your listeners, relational intelligence is a blueprint for how to build relationships. But the way that everyone does it and how they apply these skills is all going to be different. The way you establish rapport is going to be different than the next person. And mm -hmm. the way that you develop trust, you know, for one person, trust might mean people honor their commitments. For another person, it may be someone of high integrity. So all these things are different, but these skills are universal in terms of the application but how people do it based on our personality and our cultural upbringing, all those different factors. I'm so glad you brought that up because I feel like, you know, someone might be like, well, what's the key to establishing rapport? Like we obviously talked a little about it, but there isn't this out of the box thing that you say or do, or it's just not going to sound like you at the end of the day. And a lot of people will look at some of this, well, if I want to get someone in bed or if I want to get what I want yeah. out of the relationship, I'll just do these skills, it'll crash mm -hmm. and burn quickly. Because like Absolutely. I said, the two underlying things with relational intelligence are authenticity and intentionality. So you can't be authentic and try to manipulate people. You can't be authentic and try to deceive people. Those type of people have relationships and with them quickly. And hey, while we're talking about relational skills, I really think these are topics that you can bring on a date. Yeah. You could say, yeah. oh, I just learned something about relational yeah. intelligence. Yeah. How do you yeah. think rapport is established? How do you try to understand other people? At least it becomes a conversation because I can see, Julie, how someone could get <laughs> in a very dark hole of this, like, oh, I need to build rapport. How how do yeah. I do that? I uh, need to yeah, yeah. embrace <laughs> individual differences. Yes. <laughs> so many overthinkers that are not actually putting this into practice or just think about it in a vacuum. So I'm glad that we can think about it in that way. Let's hold that thought for a quick message. This episode is made possible by OMG Yes. Think about this. Wouldn't you experience more pleasure if you knew more about it? OhMyGodYes.com is a website with findings from the largest ever research study into women's pleasure. In partnership with Kinsey Institute researchers, they asked tens of thousands of women what made their pleasure better, solo and with partners. And then they found the patterns in those discoveries that are all organized on this website as super honest videos, animations, and how-tos. And just to clarify, OMGS is for everyone who is interested in women's pleasure. My friend first recommended to me and I'm so glad that she did because I love that I have access to a plethora of experiences and techniques that are detailed so openly without any blushing or shame. One thing their research found is how easy it is for us to lose our curiosity about pleasure and intimacy. So many of us think that we already know, but finding out what works for other people can help you find new things you didn't even know you or your partner liked. I feel like the whole website is designed to support and promote my pleasure. Go to omgs.com slash dateable for a special discount. That's omgyes.com slash d-a-t-e-a-b-l-e. Have you ever thought about how much better dating would be if you had a whole army of people supporting you along the way? We know that dating can be frustrating and lonely. 
but it can also feel fulfilling and fun. Have you recently decided you want to make some changes to your love life? Maybe you've recently re-entered the dating scene. Maybe you've gone on one too many dates that went nowhere. Or maybe you're just ready to take your current relationship to the next level. That is exactly why we created The Sounding Board, a true extension of our podcast that delivers a personalized experience, which includes monthly office hours where you can drop in and chat with us about anything, weekly sound offs with guided discussions, and regular virtual happy hours. Allow Julie and I to become your dating Sherpas to provide real-time guidance and wisdom in a more intimate way so we can all navigate dating and relationships together. Join the sounding board today by going to datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Again, that's datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Okay, going back to intentional generosity versus like this quid pro quo kind of mentality that some daters have. If I give you this, I expect you to give me that back. How does that play into developing trust again? I'm I'm still trying to make that relationship. If it's going back to the vulnerability piece and you wanting to build the relationship, one of the ways to develop trust is what you're giving to the relationship. If you're intentionally generous without wanting something back, that shows your partner that you're invested in what the relationship could be. And so that's a great way to build trust as well, not just honoring your commitments, but it's pouring into the relationship, investments you're making. Mm. That's really interesting because I feel like, okay, so my partner's really into going to concerts. That's something that Mm -hmm. I didn't really do as much. You know, it's funny because like I've been going with him and sometimes he'll be like, it means so much that you're doing this. And I'm like, oh, it's just a concert. But I'm like, when you look back on it, it's actually saying a lot more. It's like, I'm investing in him and showing trust that I want to give to this relationship, but I want to make him happy. So I feel like there's ways that we can look into, I mean, that some of it's just really understanding your partner and what matters to them. But like, there's little things that we could all do to really embrace that trust. I feel like people think trust, it's like, you know, like, I'll never cheat or something like big like that. But what I'm learning here is that it's all these like micro interactions that add up over time. Yeah. And this is a hard thing for a lot of people in the dating world to wrap their heads around. Most people think trust must be earned. Mm -hmm. When we talk about relational intelligence, trust must be given, not earned. Ah. It is quicker for you to build it if you extend it. That is a huge takeaway. (laughs) Yeah, you just flipped that on its head. So it's not about, uh, let's see if this person won't cheat on me. Let's see if this person will show up. It's like, I'm going to show up for this person. I'm going to be faithful. And in turn, I'm building that trust and I'm showing up. All of this actually is like, how do I show up for a relationship? How do I show up in dating? It's on me. Yeah. Yeah. This last one, I'm going to have a really hard time connecting this to dating. (laughs) Cultivating influence. What does that mean? All that means is the ability to have a positive and meaningful impact on someone else's life. And so if you Mm. go through the cycle of a relationship and move towards long-term marriage, you know, that kind of piece, it's about putting the needs of your partner before yourself. It's about wanting the best for them. It's about helping them figure out if it's a career thing or a life thing, you know, helping them grow, helping them develop. And so people who cultivate influence, they genuinely care about their partner and they want to see their partner happy in their career. They want to see their Mm. partner happy in other aspects of their life, whether it's with family or with friends. And so they are making those investments again to help them grow and to help them develop. And sometimes that's having the tough conversations. If you get to this point in a relationship, there should be a strong degree of trust where you can be honest and kind of share where maybe they drop the ball or maybe they let you down or maybe they let other people down. And so sometimes it's holding them accountable to commitments or holding them accountable to things that they said they were going to do. And so the cultivating influence, you know, the word influence can mean different things to different people. Mm -hmm. The way we talk about it and the way it ties into relational intelligence, it's wanting to bring the best out in your partner. I could definitely see it into the context that you just said, you know, once you're married and, you know, like this is really a lifelong, but I also see this in early stage dating too, is like, that's against this giving to someone is I want to be there for you. And one of the things I've learned over the years is how do I do that in a way, like I'm putting my partner first, but I'm also putting myself first. And it's not like at the expense of my own happiness, because I've definitely done that before. If that's a concern, like I want to be there for my partner, but I also don't want to lose myself, like, how would you answer that? What are they thinking about when they say that? Because I look at, you know, just in my own life in dating, there's a lot of things I do as a business psychologist in terms of goal setting and things. Like one thing we've done at my firm for the last decade is we have a word of the year every year about in terms of like what we're going to go after and what we're going to focus on. Like this year for us, it was Unleash. We wanted to unleash Mm. relational intelligence to the business world. So, and when I'm dating, I'm going on dates with people and we're talking about things, I'll share that with them. You know, that's an investment Mm -hmm. I'm making in the person. Like, have you ever set goals for yourself? Do you have, you know, New Year's resolutions? 
business. Well, here's the thing we do at my firm where I do personally, we have a word of the year. Again, it's just making an investment in the person and saying, hey, you could try this if you want or something that might be helpful. That's investing in the person. That's wanting the best for them. And it's not taking anything away from you. So I guess, Julia, it's like, what is the thing that the person might be thinking about where they might be giving up something of themselves? Because these can be little things that you're doing to try to make your partner better. It's like a win-win situation. How do I add to someone else's life and in turn also add to my life? And I like this framework because we're less focused on the outcome. And in dating, the outcome is always like, will this person like me back? Will we get into a relationship? This is like, even if you don't get into a relationship, you've added to someone else's life and therefore you've made yourself a better person too. And you can't go wrong with that. There's no losing in that. I think that's like a great segue to takeaways because I think my biggest takeaway is we really need to shift the way we approach dating and relationships. So much of it's been like, from what am I going to get to what am I going to give? And, you know, the trust was like the perfect example, like the trust. There's so much in our society that say trust should be earned, but it's like, how do I give and not give at the expense that I'm like, it's like tit for tat or I'm not getting things back or I'm doing it at my own expense. But like what we were just talking about, give in a way that's also filling your own cup and looking at this as a way to build this relational intelligence, no matter what the outcome. And even if you are the most single of people, you can do this at work. You could do this with your friends, with your family, like relational intelligence. Like your book is not just about dating and relationships. It's about this is a life skill that we need to have. And honestly, I really believe this is one of the biggest issues in modern dating is that we don't think about this. We think about, you know, how we're getting screwed over or how do we protect ourselves instead of how do we give to another human being and connect with someone. Julie, I might have to hire you to be the spokesperson because you just summarized it better than I (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll happily take that job. So, <laughs> oh, Julie's like, I'm giving my notice to Dateable. I found a new, new career path, the spokesperson for relational intelligence. We could do Dateable and that. <laughs> That's true. It goes hand in hand. This is, you know, on one hand, it's very tactical, but on the other hand, it's a very philosophical way to look at dating. I'm at a point where I'm just like all about what is it that I'm giving out into the world and been obsessed with Jay Shetty's book, (laughs) Think Like a Monk. And he talks about identity. He's like, your identity in this world is how you think other people perceive you. It's the same idea as if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it. Did it make a sound, right? It's the same thing with relational skills and relational intelligence. It's like, if I want to be this type of person in a relationship, I need to give that out into the world and see it reflected back to me. Mm. If that's not reflected back to me, I'm just creating this idea of myself in silo and I'm actually not sharing it. And so many of our listeners are scared or they're paralyzed by dating is that they don't want to go out there and meet these people thinking it's going to fail, thinking it's not Mm going to end in a romantic connection, thinking that there's nobody out there for them. This conversation is showing it doesn't have to end in romantic relationships for you to develop develop these relational skills yeah. and the relational intelligence you will eventually need for a relationship. So get right. out there and start relating to people using yeah. these five skills to hone in on like what it is that you want to put out in the world. Yeah. And that's what the book focuses on. It's split into two halves. The first half of the book, there's a chapter on each of the five skills. And we offer practical tips at the end of each chapter to work on those skills. So again, if this is a blueprint, you have kind of the cheat sheet in each chapter. The second half of the book is the applications of relationships relational intelligence. So there's a chapter on family, there's a chapter on friendships, there's a chapter on professional, and then there's a chapter on dating and marriage. So it really kind of runs the gamut because this is a skill set that you can use personally and professionally. Well, now that we're on that topic, where could people find your book? Because I yeah, 100% absolutely. we read the book, we love the book and agree like this is the whole point of dating is in all the other aspects too, is to build these skills so you have them like this goes hand in hand. Your listeners can go to our website. It's Bandelli and Associates, A-N-D, all one word, dot com. We'll have links there to the book. You can get on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Apple Books. We also have our social media platforms. You can follow me, Adam Bandelli on Instagram or on LinkedIn, Twitter. We are releasing new content every week. The dating article we released last month, we just released an article on how relationally intelligent people rebuild trust hmm. when it's been damaged. Ooh, that's and good. so we have a very kind of seven steps things that people do if they've damaged trust intentionally or unintentionally, the things they can do to try to rebuild it. And so we'll be releasing a lot more of that information in the next couple of weeks. And then early next year, we're developing our relational intelligence test. So mm, in three, four months, yes. I'll be able to let each of you know what your relational intelligence is today. Ooh. <laughs> 
Log on to our website, take the assessment and get some feedback in terms of how you show up today. Oh, we love a good assessment. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we do. We'll definitely link all that for our listeners. And, you know, this conversation has been so wonderful. So thank you again for coming on our podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And for all of our listeners, we need to develop our relational skills. And for us to understand if we're succeeding at it is if you give us a rating and reviews in Apple Podcasts (laughs) is our only way of knowing if you like our content or not. So we know we're relating to you. So five stars, something nice (laughs) that usually helps us boost our ego when it comes to our relational intelligence. (laughs) And we promise that we'll keep working on our relational intelligence after this conversation. On that note, we're going to wrap up this episode. Stay Stay datable. datable. The Datable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Datable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag stay datable and trust us, we look at all those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. At the Home Depot, we have the tools for you to give the gift of a smarter home with savings on top brands like the Google Hub, a command center for your smart devices that raises the IQ of your entire home or the Nest Learning Thermostat that helps you conserve energy and save on your bill. And if you don't know what to get, gift cards are a smart gift no matter what they get. So this year, gift smarter with savings on tools to make your holiday magic. The Home Depot, how doers get more done.